Hello everyone and welcome back to Solar System Tourism in Kerbal Space Program 1.8.1 with Realism Overhaul where I send my Twitch livestream audience to their preferred destination providing that they pay with the in-stream currency Struts which they earn by watching. In this video we begin with the launch of the Daenerys SSTO carrying a stage with food, water and oxygen and potentially the ability to bring home Arthur and Katak who are around Mercury. Now the Daenerys SSTO is capable of launching 880 tons to low Earth orbit and I use it sparingly though fairly often in this series so far mainly because of the people wanting to go to places like Mercury. And so here we are again uh, trying to help our Mercury tourists uh, return home. Uh, last time we had checked on their Delta V and it didn't seem like quite enough to capture around Earth successfully after making the transfer. They could make the transfer but they couldn't capture so we're sending this over to help and the food, water and oxygen would just be enough for the trip home basically and otherwise it's meant to push them on their way. This stage has two Timberwind 250, so these are nuclear engines, pebble bed reactors, and the next stage is an Attila thruster, which is an augmented arc jet connected to a really big reactor, so also nuclear, and it basically has the specific impulse efficiency of an ion engine, but with more thrust, so we can do the burns in insane amounts of time, which is important around Mercury orbit because Mercury's orbit is so fast that the normal ion engines just take too long to do the burns in order to make things happen so uh, the trip there is gonna take a fairly short amount of time and we managed to get an encounter with an additional correction our initial burn did not actually get the encounter but we plot a good correction and then I check what it would take to capture though and that takes a lot like 13,000 so that's not great we do have that amount and if we combine what this has with the amount that Arthur and Katak already have that's not too bad it's possible to bring them back based with that uh, based on that but we'll see this of course doesn't have any crew capacity it's just gonna push them and give them additional Delta V like that. But just in case that doesn't work, I decide to just go ahead and use my largest rocket to send something even more definitive. Well, I say more definitive, but it's got about the same amount of Delta V. It's still got an Attila thruster, it's just sized up a bit. And, but it does have the crew capacity. So then we don't have to worry about using their uh, existing capsule to come back, which isn't that much room anyway. This is the Monument rocket, unfortunately not being launched off of the Monument platform yet. This is capable of 3,000 tons to low Earth orbit and is used very sparingly, mainly because of the lag. Uh, of course, I've tested this in 1.11 with Waterfall and that gets better performance, but this is a uh, ways back. This stream is from November of last year. So we're, we've got a lot of streams to still produce in this series. Don't worry, we're not going to be short of content. So yeah, uh, there's a bit of a lag between the live streams and what I place on YouTube. So keep that in mind. Uh, though it's all good, there's the raise asterisk as I eventually decided to call it. That booster separation. And here we continue on with this magnificent looking rocket. Technically the monument rocket is just the uh, two stages down below with the struts connecting, uh, serving as the intertanks. And the first stage has currently 41 M1 engines and this has 13 M1 engines. M1 was a proposed conversion, of, but basically it was sort of based on the F1 but was hydrogen and oxygen. So that they have lots of thrust and efficiency. So here we are making orbit and that's the end of that stage. So we separate and there's our nearly 3,000 tons right there. And once again it's a nuclear stage and perilously close to the second stage there as we try and turn 
very gingerly. Interesting look. Yep, it's just sort of hanging out. They are sort of dumb stages. And here we are turning to the maneuver node and burning for Mercury. So fairly hefty burn, 6,400-ish meters per second. This stage can handle it. Five of the Timberwind engines. Again, uh, 2,500 kilonewtons each. And that's what it looks like skirting along with Fizz Warp. And there we go. Uh, well close enough, I guess. And here, the fuel for the Attila thruster is just liquid methane. And it just shoots it out the back with great efficiency. Liquid methane got better thrust than the other options, I believe. So, there's a view of this contraption, very heavy contraption, heading out to Mercury. And fortunately, the next thing is fairly small by comparison. It does not need one of my largest launchers available. This is just the little scanner probe heading out to Ceres. And I give it a stage with lots of Gemini lander engines because those are cute and very useful. And then also a Briz stage, just for good measure. Uh, those stages both to capture around Ceres, actually. Mark one Charlie. And this happened to be launched on the anniversary of Apollo 12. So instead of listening to music during the stream, we listen to the Apollo 12 audio, which is what you're hearing. We are launching the probe on a special rocket with two Titan boosters surrounding a core that has nine Raptor engines, nine sea level Raptor engines, which I ignite right there mainly because I wasn't happy with the control provided by the Titan engines. Otherwise, we could have lit them a little bit higher up. Uh, but the upper stage is uh, New Glen second stage, so those are BE-3Us. Lately, I've uh, seen numbers on the BE-3U that make it much less attractive. Its specific impulse, its efficiency is not that good, apparently. I'm not sure. I need some verification on that. So, if it turns out that the efficiency is really that bad, then I might have to reconsider it and just go back to using J2s for this purpose, uh, as outdated as they may be. The J2X I don't like because it's too heavy, so. The Raptor 9 rocket, I also call the Unix rocket. I don't know why I put the fins on except for maybe looks because it's obviously not going to return or do anything. Maybe for stability, but I mean with the Titan boosters and everything. But alright, so there's the two BE-3Us now. And we are transferring. Uh, making orbit was weird because basically we didn't complete orbit and then we started to transfer. So we are transferring. And this stage is not enough for a transfer because of the weird situation we started out in. So the Briz stage finished up the burn, and that went fairly well. It's more controllable than the BE-3U anyway. It's not a traditional Briz stage, though. It's a Briz stage with five of the actual Briz engines. Uh, the normal Briz stage has one engine and then four verniers, but I just put extra engines in the vernier places, <laughs> so a little bit of a... Uh, thing there, but otherwise the bridge stage takes too long to do its burn. They did in fact get hit by lightning on Apollo 12, and after doing this little plot for the correction, I separate off an HTV from our mirror station around the moon, and we need to resupply that. So the HTV goes off with its weird sort of AJ-10 assembly at the back there. And with a nice little parting view, we turn to launching a new HTV to send to the moon, and I do that with the new Glenn. Because nothing too much larger was necessary, basically. Though, I did use this new Glenn in non-recoverable mode. As you can see, no fins or anything. It looks really slick like that, but obviously frowned upon in this day and age. And off go the fairings, and there's our little HTV. Zero, 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 
and making orbit. Plenty of delta v to transfer. In fact, we'll use some of the delta v to capture on the moon, I think. Or maybe there's no MLI layers and let's see. Uh, well, you, we use it to make a little correction, but then the rest is all on the HTV, which has plenty of delta v anyway. So here's the AJ10190. Obviously, the real HTV does not have an AJ10190, but it's necessary for moon missions to have something like that. And here we are approaching Mir. And getting ready to dock in the exact same place that the previous HTV had departed. That's the most convenient location by far. And... And dock. All right, so that's a moon mission. And then this is Mercury, where I decided that we needed to return Arthur and Katak back to the Mercury station because in their vessel on their own, they had enough to the food, water, and oxygen to go back home, but not enough to just loiter until the rescue vessel, I guess you could call it, uh, arrives. So they have to dock back to the station, which has the rest of the supplies. The lag around here is crazy, and I still don't know why. I don't know what causes the lag. It's a special kind of lag right around this thing and these vessels. So I haven't quite narrowed it down, but there's something doing a whole lot of calculations. I tried to check what kind of supplies they had, but when you dock like this, it doesn't immediately refresh that life support monitoring window until you change a scene. So I change a scene, but... Uh, we have other pressing things to attend to. I was pretty sure they had enough supplies. And this is the launch of a dragon to the ISS because Basila wanted to go to the ISS. So this is a paid tourist launch. I point out where we should be launching from, which is Path 39A. But anyway, this will be good enough. So don't often use the Falcon 9 because the 9 engines act with their plumes actually produce a fair amount of lag as well. And it's being launched on a KOS script, so it automatically shut down the first stage at the appropriate time. And I could drop the HUD and just enjoy the view. And here we are making orbit. No special problems. The one benefit to using the Falcon 9 is that the launch script is fairly well practiced, I guess you could say. The downside to using the Dragon capsule is it does all its burns with its RCS, not with the Super Dracos. And that takes a lot of time because they're not the most powerful little engines in the world. So yeah, as it drifts off, we didn't have to do those burns, but I'll s spare you the tedium that my live stream audience had to watch. And here we are rendezvousing with the ISS. That's nice and scenic. And we're uh, docking on the forward PMA, the usual place for Dragon. So nothing too surprising there as we get into position. Though the ISS probably isn't in the right orientation. I don't know. Yeah, it's definitely the forward PMA is definitely not heading prograde. Anyway. Here we go, and dot, dot, dot. All right, so that's done, and our tourist is on the ISS as planned, but we have even more to do. We reached a Uranus window, and so I decided to send more supplies for my Uranus mission, which just has one tourist, Mikko Gagazov, who wanted to go to Uranus's moon Miranda, and so... We do want to keep Mikko alive. Mikko hasn't arrived yet, mind you. It's a 20-year trip. So who knows when Mikko is going to arrive. But when Mikko gets there, he's going to need food, water, and oxygen because his own ship only carried the 20 years to get there. Well, with, with a little bit more. It has recyclers, so it definitely has more than 20 years but we don't know how much more because we don't know the efficiency of the recyclers depends on whether they're being kept track of properly by attack life support anyway so we're sending more to meet up with him once he arrives at uranus and 
I decide to expedite that situation by using the Daenerys SSTO. Uh, I probably overuse these big things. Though, I don't know how many launches you want to see with assembling a Uranus resupply. It would take quite a few. Even with nuclear engines like these Timuins, which we are again using, another pair. And that is the end of that stage. So we're going to use a little bit of ion engine Delta V in order to complete the burn. And we're using ion engines this time because, after all, there's no hurry with Uranus. That's a long trip, plenty of time for the burns. Uranus's orbit is not the most sensitive thing. So, but here we are getting our Uranus periapsis. If we wanted to go with a Jupiter to Uranus boost, then we would arrive at Uranus much faster, so we'd need to more delta V to slow down. So there is a downside to that. Uh, but it would get us there quicker, which saves on the supplies we need on the way there. So that's a positive, but we only get that opportunity once every 12 years because that's uh, Jupiter's overall period. So it'll only line up with Uranus. It's not exactly 12 years, but roughly speaking, that's how often we get one of those. And I didn't want to keep my tourists waiting a decade or so. So, yep, we went at an less than opportune time, but it's fine because we just use really big rockets. <laughs> so here I actually try and bring back my Daenerys SSTO to test that aspect of it out. And it barely survives re-entry with those uh, flaps that add more drag. It's very heavy uh, still, as you can see, more than 1,100 tons. And here we are getting ready to splash down. It's got Raptor descent engines, a uh, total of 16 Raptors. And unfortunately, I like them too late. I always get the timing wrong on this because the suicide burn countdown is useless in this case. And so we hit the surface a bit hard and lose the main engine, unfortunately. So, and that's more than 300 tons, by the way. Uh, that was shielded by little flaps on the engine itself through, for re-entry. But yeah, as this experiences weird buoyancy and I recover it, I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.